Yes. You suddenly understand why the professors might have a bit of difficulty with this. <laughs> There we go. Okay, cool. Yes, so again, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Caroline. I am the co-president of the War Study Society. And over here we have Tish, who's the co-president of, uh, no, president of the <laughs> War Society. You don't have to share the title. Um, and here we have our beautiful panelists. You can start by introducing yourself, who you are, what you study, and what you've done for, for institute. Maybe also your, like, academic field of interest, both what you study and then your interest, mm -hmm. yeah? Um, okay, so hello everyone, my name is Roger Cruz. Uh, I'm a third year international relations student. Um, I have specialized in Russian Eastern Europe and in a degree, but I completed a, a summer internship in finance. I worked in Goldman Sachs at the office in Warsaw last summer. Um, and I sat in the global markets division in the equities and derivatives team. Um, I just wanted to try out finance. And besides that, I have some experience working with NGOs based in Israel, Palestine, and working with lawyers without borders. So if any of you have any questions on that, I'll mainly talk about my experience at Goldman, but do ask about the others. Okay, uh, hi everyone. I'm Sabrina. I'm a third year IR student as well. and. Academically, I've specialized in sort of international political economy, political economy of finance, uh, gender in Latin America. Uh, and sort of my professional experience is usually in the multilateral affairs uh, part in the Mexican embassy as well as working in a feminist NGO for Latin American women against uh, domestic violence. Um, and besides that, I'm also just very interested in sort of the Mexican um, like community in London. So any questions regarding any of that, I'm more than happy to help. Hi, I'm Hannah. I'm a third year war study student and my academic areas of interest lay in journalism, uh, gender studies and the Asia Pacific. So currently I work as a communications ambassador for the war studies department. So I help to put out digital content on Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, um, among other social media places. Um, so this past summer, I worked as an undergraduate research fellow in the Department of Political Economy, helping to like uh, Professor Klingler Vidra write a book about startups in Southeast Asia. And I also worked at the Entrepreneurship Institute here at King's. So my experience is quite varied. Um, I'm also uh, quite active in student journalism, but I also have experience with academic research as well. So anything along those lines, feel free to ask me about. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Carolina, so I'm originally from Mexico, I'm an MA student here, I study conflict security and development, and I have a wide set of um, interests along Southeast Asia, Latin America, um, also gender studies as well, and I have had internships in the State Department, uh, also in lobbying firms like the DCI Group in Washington DC, uh, think tanks such as the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, um, the a American Enterprise Institute and various others, but I will primarily be talking about my internship in lobbying for those who are interested. Hi, Rocco Centuria from Boston. Um, I'm here as a, a STRATCOM uh, grad student. So a little bit different uh, vantage point for me. I'm about 20 years into my career. I came back to school uh, basically because my employer paid for it. That definitely was a motivating force. Uh, so basically, some of the years I've, I've worked at over the years, my resume has been a little bit all over the place, but for the most part, it's been security studies, information operations, uh, psychological operations with the Army, uh, and also to uh, finance, uh, financial advising uh, through Northwestern Mutual. So I've had a bunch of different careers. Um, I'll talk a little bit about my internships, which were uh, the Fund for American Studies, which is a think tank in D.C., and also uh, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty in Prague. Uh, and again, this is quite some time ago since the late 90s. So definitely uh, happy to share the experience I have and, and uh, be, uh, uh, you know, hopefully give you some good advice if you need it. Amazing. So as you can hear, we have quite a lot of different fields represented because the inherent nature of what it is that we study and what the Department of War study covers is not only in politics or in diplomacy, but can go into finance, can go into uh, security, can go into many, many different areas. So that's what we've been trying to cover. We were supposed to also have Casper Goldman in the panel. He unfortunately has um, gone sick. Uh, but he was supposed to talk about Dryad Global, which is a maritime security company. 
um, which is really, really interesting and also a great opportunity both for undergrads and postgrads to get into. Um, so I was thinking to talk a, a tiny bit about that as well, just because I think it's, it's something that, that you guys should be aware about um, if you're interested in getting work experience within that. So yeah, maritime security, risk intelligence, very much within the defense side of, well, defense, defense and security side, um, then focusing on, on the maritime um, era of, of international relations. And myself, I've um, been an intern at the Danish North Atlantic Treaty Association. Um, and furthermore, I volunteer at an NGO called Project Access, which doesn't really have anything to do with IR, but helps students apply um, to universities as kings, uh, but also around like the US, um, Italy, France, Switzerland, and also um, which is very exciting. So that's another kind of work experience that you can get and something that looks really well in the CV. Um, but mainly I won't be doing the talk. I just thought that I wanted to share that as well if anyone has interest in that. Um, but I wanted to come back to the to the panelists. And so the first question is for you to go a bit more in depth with your with your internship so um, or like work experience. So when and how did you get it? Um, how long did it last? Was it while you were studying? Was it like a summer internship? Was it a break? Um, and is it something that you're currently doing or working towards continuing to do? Um, yeah, so Rachel, if we could start with you. So, yeah, um, if I miss that, the, the Goldman Sachs Summer Analyst Program is a 10 weeks long uh, position that uh, happens in the first world. Um, I applied to it without having much experience in it or academic education experience in finance just because I, I wanted to try out the, um, the sector and see whether it was a good fit for me. Um, and well, I did apply, once again, you might be aware of this, but usually when you apply for finance internships, it's so. Can everyone just mute themselves online? Thank you. Yes. Can everyone hear us again? <laughs> I take that as a yes. Yes, perfect. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so if I take it back. Um, yeah, I, I completed the internship in my second year of my studies, and this is a bit rare, especially when it comes to doing internship in finance, because um, these summer like, analyst positions are usually directed to students in their last year, so by the undergraduate or masters, because uh, the ultimate goal of it is to get the full time analyst position when September comes. Um, I did reject that that role because I, I realized it was not for me, the, the corporate life of finance. But I mean, I came here to talk about how that is the position, um, having internships as a way to kind of discover a new, a new sector and getting used to it. And I have to say, I would recommend it to any of you who would like it. I did mine in Poland. so. Um, towards my degree, that's what comes it the most, just having to relocate that to a country I had never been to and which I have studied previously in, in my degree. Um, but besides, I mean, doing it in London is a possibility. Um, and if you if you have an interest in finance or anything, I would certainly recommend it. Um, it opens a lot of doors in terms of networking because the way these internships work is that you are exposed to many people and you get responsibilities from day one. So it's a great place to gain skills. For instance, um, I was enrolled in a data camp to kind of do some basic coding. Um, so that was a good scheme we had in there. And I would just say networking is probably the main asset of it. I don't know. Um, we had these one-to-one -one lunches with vice presidents in the company every day, like all the summer interns did. And so, um, I don't know, I got to know on a personal level the head of the Warsaw office. It's quite a big office, like bigger than the one in London. So that was good. Thank you. Um, so regarding the sort of current uh, internship I'm doing at the embassy, it's actually sort of related to a previous um, experience I had. So it's related to the NGO I mentioned before. And what was interesting about this sort of relationship is that um, the NGO I applied to was a volunteering job. It was a very demanding volunteering job that I was a part of for eight months and wanted to continue to do just because I really liked the cause and I, th I felt 
um, that it really related to my interest uh, in my area of study. Um, but I managed to meet the Mexican ambassador in the UK through an event that they held at the Tate Modern. Um, and it was it was just networking. I, I talked to her, I expressed my interest in, in what the embassy does. Uh, later on, I emailed her um, and she managed to, like we worked out an area that I think would suit my studies and I think that I would excel at. Um, so I think networking was such a big part of my own like sort of short-lived experience uh, in diplomacy. Uh, and sort of what was expected of me then, um, it, it depends on the day-to-day, -day, but I'm usually just working with um, most of the international maritime organization drafting in sort of the Mexican Navy and um, the embassy here. Um, so yeah, I agree with Roger's idea of networking as a very important part. Thank you. Yeah, so I'll talk about my experience as an undergraduate research um, fellow this past summer. Uh, I can't predict anything for the summer because um, of COVID, but when I completed it, it had to be online and I worked full time for about a month, which was very intense having to just communicate via Zoom um, and get relegated tasks. But my experience was amazing. Um, obviously, I'm in the war studies department, but I applied to um, a position in the political economy department. and. Yeah, don't, don't feel limited to just apply to things that just seem interesting to you. You can branch out um, and explore something else because I had, I basically didn't know anything about like startups or inclusive innovation, which was the topic I was working um, in Southeast Asia with um, the professor there. But it turned out to be a great experience um, helping her to write a book. And from the get-go, I was given pretty large, I was kind of scared of at first. Um, so I had to help alongside other Inter two other interns uh, to build a database of contacts um, all around Southeast Asia for them to contact um, and interview for the book. I also had to do an entire review um, of the manuscript they had so far and put my input. Um, and then I also had to do this really interesting activity called um, horizon scanning, where you look at Twitter, um, kind of alternative uh, media sources to see what kind of things are popping up in the startup world in Southeast Asia. So the applications for this come out pretty late um, compared to some other things. So I think I applied for this in April and I heard back in late May about it. So it's it's a great opportunity. Um, and don't feel like discouraged um, because you're just a first year if you're applying. Like there was also a first year um, that I was working with alongside as well. I guess it's also worth noting that the War Studies has their own research fellowship. It started last year. So this is the King's Undergraduate Research Fellowship. Um, and the department is quite good at sending it out like well in, ad in advance, I would say. Uh, but then there's also one specifically for War Studies. So it's something about if you've done the King's Research Fellowship, you can only do that once, but then you can apply to the War Studies one. Um, and exactly the same process where you choose your project and send in an application and like why you you would fit in um, to this framework. Yeah, so I just wanted to, to mention that as well. Carolina. Cool, um, yeah, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about my lobbying internship. So this is really funny because um, before doing that internship, I was actually waiting for my security clearance for the State Department uh, because they take a really long time, especially if you weren't born in the US. So they basically were interviewing all my family members and everything and I decided to just go out and like network in DC. And I met this lady who was very nice at one of the networking events. And she said, well, how about if you come with us to a DCI group and you do an internship if the State Department doesn't work? So it ended up being that fortunately, well, I got my State Department internship. So I worked with the Balkans Bureau and that was really nice. So I got to um, do a lot of different things uh, with diplomats and sort of see that um, world that I always dreamed about in as an undergrad and then it turns out that the lady was so very interested in having me so I told her well you know I'm doing the State Department internship because she said as you should um, but I still want to work with you guys so it turns out that during this time it was like COVID time so I don't know if you guys had like an existential crisis or something but I was having one so I was like what am I going to do with my life and I'm like you know what I'm going to apply for my master's it's during this period that this lady calls me after I get my King's acceptance letter to come here. And she says, oh, well, we have a position that's open. And I'm like, well, that's too late. Like I already, you know, I'm going to my master's. So she says, well, what about if you do an internship? 
So during the summer, the summer and a little bit of like the fall, I started doing my internship at the lobbying firm. I worked as a client consultant for AT&T. So I had no idea what a lobbying firm really was until like you're truly emerging it. Because lobbying means a lot of different things, right? Especially when you work with AT&T, you're like, wait, am I just going to be lobbying for phones? Like, it's kind of weird. Um, so it was kind of like a very immersive experience because I realized that lobbying is connected to many different things. So if you're interested in international relations, if you're interested in like economics and many, many different things, I think lobbying is like a good field for it. Uh, some of the projects that I got to work on was um, basically summarizing 46 different trade agreements um, for a lot of different countries about uh, telecommunications, submarine cables, um, in general, like things related to media, to filming. So I got to know that um, Gossip Girl was going to be filmed in London <laughs> for some part, so that was pretty cool. Uh, but it, was, it involved a lot of, um, I guess, intercultural um, communication because I talked to a lot of people that were in the offices in Singapore, some people were in Croatia, and since we were all remote, this was um, possible. So this internship really did expose me to that and, you know, just kept me open-minded about what the future holds because I think in general, like, I'm a person who loves to do everything. Like, I just really want to learn about all that there is out there. And I think this internship and this field really showed me that it is possible to know, like, snippets of everything and just to be engaged. Um, so one thing that I learned uh, that I would really recommend to all of you guys is always consider your options. Say yes, but always wonder if, maybe not now, because that's very important, because just because you get one internship right now, it doesn't mean that the internship you turn down won't hire you tomorrow. Um, so take a look at that and also make sure you make friends. It's important to make genuine connections with the people you network with because they can tell if you're being fake. Um, if you want something out of somebody, then that's not going to be great. If you have a meeting with somebody in relation to, you know, just a job interview, internship interview, take notes. Like, do they mention a dog? Do they mention a daughter? Like, something like that. Like, I know it sounds creepy, but if you keep, like, these little, like, files on your phone about this person, you can be like, oh, by the way, like, I remembered your daughter liked New York, so I brought you this book from New York or something like that. So little things like that that are actually genuine can actually lead you to these opportunities that just can be around the corner for you. Uh, so obviously a lot said right there and a lot of really, really great stuff. I'll, I'll look at it maybe from a different standpoint, looking back upon my my, my uh, internship experience with the hindsight of about, I want to say I was doing the math real quick, about 24 years. So how do I look at, at that after three different careers and in my internships? And I, probably the biggest piece of advice I would give, and this has been, been said a little bit already, but don't be so necessarily fixated on one particular inter internship, one particular lane that you might go. You never know what exactly is going to transpire in your career down the road that an internship that may not have seemed to be as important might actually be really, really helpful. For me, I, I thought I knew what I wanted to do. I worked for a, a lobby group, a lobbyist group in DC called the American Foreign Policy Council, and I worked for Radio Free Europe in, in uh, Prague. Um, and I did not really know what I, I thought I knew what I wanted, but I wasn't quite sure. Looking back upon it, being in several different industries, those experiences were extremely important just from a standpoint of making that transition very comfortable in an academic environment and now being very comfortable into an, an employment environment. And when I look, when my company actually looked at hiring, uh, you know, interns, we didn't really look for someone saying, this is my calling, this is what I want, this is, what I, this is the direction I want to go. We looked for things that were very intangible work ethic, attitude, preparation for the meeting, things of that nature. What I learned in my internships really has helped me out through four different careers, which was professional athletics. I was a nightclub manager for a long time, was a financial advisor, and then I was, uh, actually worked for the, uh, for the US Embassy last in Budapest. So I've had four very, very different um, uh, careers. Uh, I'm 47, so the math does add up if anyone's trying to figure that out. But if you, if you just go into it with open mind, your internship, regardless of what it is, and you put everything into it, and a lot of what's been said right here in terms of the work ethic and the, and the, and the uh, ability to make some connections, you'll definitely have a very, very good experience of it. Just don't be crushed if you don't get the one you want. It's, it, it's important, but it's not as important as you might think. Your framework is right here, and I can say from looking more like this, your perceptions might change a little bit down the road. 
Amazing. Thank you so much, guys. Um, so next question goes a bit more into what most of you actually have covered already. So, so is it important to get an internship? Because as we know, it is. It can be quite intense to study in the in the department. I don't know on an MA level, but I know from a BA third year level, um, it's intense. Um, so, is it important to get an internship? What what can you get out of it? Um, do you recommend getting one whilst you're studying? What's your experience with that? Do you um, think it's better to wait, maybe between your BA and masters? Um, what's your experience with this? Um, sorry if I may take it. Um, I do believe it's important. It's not crucial. However, it does help, especially if you have in mind, let's say, um, going into postgraduate studies after this, um, you might want to take a step back and consider what can help me get it, because you have to play at the end of the day and you have to show some interest. And having done an internship in the sector is actually quite relevant. Um, so do consider that. At the same time, it's not just an internship, just a volunteering role or whatnot can also help you. So, and yeah, don't be discouraged by rejections because like Tish knows it, my list of rejections was lengthy. Um, but, Our list of rejections. <laughs> um, yeah, no, other than that, um, yeah, I would recommend. I don't know how it is doing it whilst you're studying. Um, what I've done is, yeah, different projects, but it's never a part-time thing. It's more of like a punctual, just collaborating with someone. Um, so I believe you may be able to illustrate us more on this. Um, yeah, so I think talking from my personal experience and what I've heard from the panelists, I think that internships, you know, it's not like a, if you don't get it, you will like never get a job and are a failure because at least that's how I felt this in the first year. I was like, if I don't get an internship this summer, it was the summer COVID started and like the chances of getting an internship in anything were quite rare. But I had this sort of like a mounting pressure. If I don't get an internship now, in like the UN, I'm gonna like die. And that's not the case at all, right? Like, yeah, there's so many rejections, like you just need one mm -hmm. to work out. That's literally it, you need one thing to work out for you. And after that, it just sort of snowballs into a lot of the opportunities that are related to it, or at least that was the way for me. Um, and um, both all the things I did with the NGO and now were during term time. The NGO thing was different because it was online, the school was online, so I could just like, go to the headquarters, do my seminar, and then like start the sessions. Um, I was working with elderly Latina migrants, which is really lovely. Um, now, I think it's a lot more challenging, and I don't know if I'd recommend it. Um, I don't think I'd recommend it for first years or third years, uh, if it's like in-person class, just because you're so overwhelmed as a first year that you're just going to feel like amounting pressures, and, and you're just adapting to kings. And as a third year, I can confidently say that I with dissertation and just don't have any time to relax ever. Um, I think as a second year, it's it could be possible uh, if you have really good time management skills and a lot of dedication. Um, but yeah, the summers are great um, and they're super lengthy as a King student. Um, and even after you finish your undergrad or your master's, you know, you're still fresh off school, you can apply to these internships and you'll be set. Yeah, so I work ad hoc right now as a communications ambassador for the War Studies Department, and I think as a third year, um, that's definitely the most I can handle on my plate right now, not to discourage anybody from having like a part-time internship, um, but it's just, you know yourself better than anybody. If you know you can't commit 10 to 15 hours a week um, to something other than your studies, then there's no point in doing it just to put it on your CV. Um, but I definitely recommend if you can getting an internship in the summer because yeah, as you said, like you have so much time to work. I was able to squeeze in too. So um, definitely like a worthwhile experience, but like as has been said before, it's not the end of the world. If you don't get an internship, I definitely felt like that when I was applying. Um, but yeah, I learned last minute that I got an internship in like late May, literally when I was doing my last exam. And then even as summer rolls on, internships don't run out. There's always going to be something in your email or if you check King's Careers Connect, there's always something available for you to apply to. Um, so yeah, I encourage you to get an internship if you can. Yeah, so I guess um, I had a little bit of a different experience. So I started my first internship when I was a first year, uh, but that was in the summer. So I like just worked all summer long in a writing internship. And then my sophomore year, I went to my second semester to Washington, D.C. So that's where I interned with the um, Inter American Enterprise Institute, I think, tank in D.C. 
Uh, and I really, really liked that experience because the way that my program was created, at least, it was like in the morning we didn't have classes and we had our internships and then at night we had classes. So it was pretty much very loaded, very difficult, but I'm super grateful for those years that I had that experience because it really taught me a lot about discipline. And at the end of the day, you still have a lot of time to also have fun. Like that's what summer is for, that's what other things are for. But I do think it's necessary that if you're taking a class that you're like, mm, I'm not sure about this. Like, don't discourage it because that's also not the real world. Like, you need to make sure that you are taking your education that's off the books into the real world. Uh, so I think that's really, really essential. Uh, my senior year or my last year of um, university, I also did like an internship. So I worked with the State Department um, during my last semester. Um, I love that internship. I think that was like probably one of my favorite internships. Like. Because in between the summers, I would always do these internships, but it just felt like La La Land or something that was just like, you had so much time, so you would dedicate everything to your internship. And in a way, it was almost like more stressful because there's no time management, because it's just like, you have to dedicate everything because it's like, there's no excuse. But when I interned for the State Department, it was quite nice because I would just organize my schedule around my internship and also make sure that if you do decide to take an internship when you're taking classes, let your employers know what you can and cannot take because if you overcommit yourself and you're being overwhelmed that's definitely not worth it like you are probably working like you're working for them remember that but you also choose them it's not just them choosing you so you have to also tell them like hey like i have this coming up this and that and that does not hinder you in any way because you're a student and they should know that um, so i would say in my opinion i think having an, an internship is essential because especially when you go into like the job sector, um, that's when you can find like more connections easily. But again, I'm coming from the US background where we literally get stuck with like, you have to do an internship right away. Uh, so that might be a little different for you guys. But again, give things a chance. Like there's always summer. If you feel like you can take a little bit more of like less of a load of classes in one module, um, make sure you consider that option make sure you tell them too. like I can't work every day I can only work these days too because again you choose that I'm not just only them choosing you um just some notes on the there real quick so obviously some really really good points a couple of things I'll stay away from as it's already been covered but to me internships extremely important from for the bulk of people I see in my employment right now we have a, a, I'd say probably 60 percent of, of are under the age of 30. the biggest issue is the face-to-face uh, interaction that we have with, with people. And I think that's something an internship can really help out because we got plenty of people who are great with tech, great with laws and stuff, but they, they struggle a little bit when it comes to face to face, especially when you're dealing with large multinationals, different types of environments. Obviously, King's is a good place for this to get used to that type of behavior, but this is academics. This is still not an employment. So there's a little bit of a difference. Definitely set your boundaries in terms of what you can and can't do. Try to look at it from your own personal preference of if you do extracurricular activities a lot, how much do you do per week normally? And then maybe your internship sort of takes that place. You know you can handle that amount. So it gives you like sort of like a frame of reference. Um, also to um, what else is in the one uh, I already forgot it. Uh, just but just in general, remember, keep it in perspective what you're doing, right? Try to get the most out of it. I would highly encourage doing it. Um, I, I personally like the idea of doing it in the summer. A lot of that was because I had extra curriculums during the school year, whether it was sports or student government. So personal preferences, but just try to be as realistic as possible. Remember, you should be doing something that helps your career. You shouldn't be hating it, right? It should be fun. You should be getting something out of it. And one last thing, occasionally, you may have to be in a situation of an internship where you might have to push your employer as much as they push you. If you feel like you're off in a corner, and no one's explaining to you this is how things are done. That's the, the internship agreement right there. You work your tail off, but they should be telling you this is how things are done so you get some professional development. Mm -hmm. Ali, can I just step in for a second? Yeah. Um, first of all, thank you all. Um, just now this sort of halfway point, I wanted to add a little practical note. Um, for a lot of people, when you're applying for internships, especially if you're looking at consulting, banking, anything finance related, it's the first time you go through a corporate recruitment process and there's a lot of new terms that will be popping up um, and there's sort of software that you need to familiarize yourself with if consulting or like even strategic communications, I'm sure I'll agree has some of this and it's like higher views and fine metrics. 
um, I'm sure Roger can talk a bit about this as well. If you're looking at either of those sectors, it's sort of, you can't avoid them. So high these are like these digital interviews where you talk, you're given a question prompt, you talk into a camera, and there's no recruiter on the other side. You just record yourself speaking. And it's really daunting at first, um, but you can't escape it, basically. And then biometrics are online tests that look at your cultural fit with the company, and they like personality tests, basically. But I will say, before you start doing the final applications, before you actually start doing these for the companies, do practice tests for both. Do practice high of these, open photo booth or whatever, open a camera app, give yourself your prompts and then record your answers, watch it back, see where you're making eye contact with the camera, look at what your body posture is like, because recruiters look at that. Um, and then with the fine metrics, do practice fine metrics. And before you start, look at the company's pages, and I'm sure everyone here will agree as well, in those applications, when you're writing your cover letters, specifically someone who doesn't have prior work experience, the only thing they're going to assess you on is your bubble and your CV. Um, so you need to be able to demonstrate a reason for why you're applying for that job and a reason for why you're a good fit. And often the best way to do that is looking at not only the Our Culture page of the company website, but also go onto LinkedIn, look at the top management, look at their education background, look at their work background, try to come up with like a frame of what their ideal hire looks like. Because more often than not, you see some form of continuity. You see that some people have a specific, like all these people in this place have gone to Oxford, for example. And also, oh yeah, for international students, sponsorship, maybe you guys, Roger, maybe you can talk a bit about that. Um, these are sponsorship for internships is a reason why the summer is a good time to do it, because often your hours that you can work as a full-time student in the summer are different to what you can work full-time in non-term time. So as an international student, I know I did a six-month work placement in the summer, which I wouldn't be able to do after. Um, and just one last note is that please avoid giving into peer pressure because it's really easy, specifically in London, being in this commercial hub that we're in, to go for the easy option of like the big firms, the consulting firms, the management firms, um, but it's not for everyone. And I will, the one piece of advice I'll give is if you don't enjoy the process of applying to a firm, you're probably not going to like the job. Um, because it is very, very reflective of it. Um, so make sure you look at that, make sure you keep that in mind. If you don't enjoy doing the maths part of the of the like desk when you're applying and if you're struggling to do it, you probably will not do very well at the role as well. Um, so those are just a few practical tips to keep in mind. I'll have to I'll throw them in now. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you, Tish. That was super helpful. Uh, also, I think coming from like a small NGO uh, background, uh, the Andrea was working with deal, uh, dealt with domestic violence and Latin American migrants, which is something I'm working on my dissertation because I thought it was so interesting. But I think also I know a lot of people in OIL are really interested in like humanitarian crisis, uh, you know, just human rights, um, sort of maybe violence on a transnational level because of the modules that we take, especially coming from like a gender perspective. And I think something that's super important and we've mentioned sort of like a bit, um, but I also think especially for the case of NGOs. Uh, of communicating with your employer about emotional burnout. I know that I dealt with this specifically, and I carried this on through other um, sort of jobs that I applied for uh, in the sort of uh, application process. A lot of it was sort of like exercises on like, what would you do if X person came to you with this sort of problem of domestic violence? How would you contact it? And, you know, I'm not a psychology student. I'm not a psychologist. Um, I have some previous experience of that part, but a lot of it was uh, very emotionally tiring and there's a lot of sort of secondary trauma that is kind of dumped onto you and then you just like well deal with it because you know you're the volunteer you're the intern um and they don't give you this sort of prep course of course the bigger the ngo they're more likely to give you some sort of guidance into how to deal with the secondary trauma um but it's just important to keep in mind that uh in case of not as technicals but just sort of more like the nature of the job that you're applying for you have to communicate with them and, you know, they chose you, they picked you, you picked them. You can't just put on this pressure on yourself and then be like, well, I have to deal with this because I'm the intern. You can just always communicate, like, I don't think you're preparing for me is like the right way. I think I need some help. And most of the times, I think probably all the times are going to be like quite um, understanding and will give you the sort of support that you need. But I think that's super important as well. Yeah, I think that's some, some brilliant points. And I think one thing is, to be aware of the field that you are looking to go into if it's within security defense humanitarian crisis for example but i think another thing like going back to the point on consultancies or law firms or banking i think they're kind of very known for 
these burnout phases that you enter when you start, for example, a full-time position. So also be aware of that. And, and even if you go into a non-paid NGO job, for example, or volunteer, it's really, really important, especially also if you then work during your studies, just to be open about it. Be good at setting boundaries. Again, um, I don't can't remember who mentioned it, but but be able to say, okay, I can work these days and I can't work these other days because I only have eight contact hours a week and I really want to engage with those eight hours and I need to prepare for them. But I can, of course, help you out on Tuesdays and Fridays or whatever. Um, yeah, so, so just keep that in mind. It could be that it's something that you will forget as soon as you, you leave this room, but but as soon as you go into kind of like the internship, work experience, job market, um, it's something that's important to go back to because when you first reach a burnout, that's very difficult to kind of like return from. And again, that's not to scare any of you. It's just to be mental health awareness. <laughs> um, we're doing our part. Um, okay, cool. So I think we'll actually take some questions from uh, the online room just because there are some really relevant ones. Um, and could be that we will start with Rocco. Um, it's about where to to find internships and where to look for resources also outside Kings. And it could be that any of you have any tips on this. So so where do you actually, you sit as an international relations student, a war studies student in the, within the department and you're like, mm, okay, I could really, I really want to, to find something <laughs> that's not necessarily what we have so, mentioned or yeah. my country doesn't have an embassy where I can work during the term. I'm gonna, what do I do? I'm going to defer on this one because I went through my internship 26 years ago. <laughs> okay, <laughs> fair enough. I literally found it on a bulletin board. I just walked around and finally I found it on the internet. So, I found it on this one, so, I, so look around the department. <laughs> <laughs> hey, they do hang a few things up, I see yeah. right now. Yeah. But I definitely I think this is a more qualified crowd right here. Yeah, of course. And I guess I think the department will be really happy if we say read your email. <laughs> yeah, I think you've all heard this plenty of times. So read your emails, look at the work studies hub. Um, there are some really useful sources there. Okay, but yes. Can yeah, you? well, I was going to say, um, it's kind of funny, we all talked about networking, 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 and we totally forgot about our professors. Like, our professors are probably one of the coolest people out there. Like, they're experts in their field. They will get to know you. They are very, very nice. So I'm sure if you talk to a professor and you say, I mean, one of my favorite professors, her name is Professor Christine Chen. Um, she used to work for like the World Bank. Like if you talk to her and you're like, I want to know more about your career, let me know this and that, they will help you because you have this solidarity between being your professor and your student and you show interest in their career because that's what you want to do, right? So I would start by talking to your professors. If you think there's one professor who's like more approachable, go to their office hours don't be afraid to be like hey i'll invite you for coffee and we talk about this um so they'll, they'll be a great resource another thing that i would say is um there's this website called globaljobs.com uh, they post internships like all over the world so i would say that's um, it's a very good resource uh, they have internships entry jobs um they also have like all kinds of like internships relating to ir finance uh, different things like that. Idealist.com is also really good. Um, another thing that I would say this is more of like a long-term project, uh, but it's just to look at your like LinkedIn. Oh, there we go. Um, I was going to say to look at your in LinkedIn as a way to sort of like market yourself. So make sure if you're doing like a really cool project at school and you're like, I'm doing this like work with, I don't know, like, um, I guess space strategy or something like that. Why not like post it on LinkedIn? Why not say, oh, I did this, I did that. Because if you get more like views on your things, then people are likely to reach out. Like for instance, during the pandemic, I started a blog and I posted something about, um, it was like the 19th amendment anniversary. It was the first time that it was like um, my time voting. So because I just became a US citizen and I posted about that experience and somebody reached out to me and they're like, well, do you want to write for like our main page or a campaign or whatever? And I was like, yeah, sure. And then they saw like another company saw that I had written for this company and they hired me for a full time position to work with a campaign content creation firm. And so at the end of the day, it's all about how you market yourself, like talk to your professors, talk to your fellow peers. You never know, like um, something might turn out there. Look at globaljobs.com. 
and in uh, idealist.com also, and LinkedIn is your best friend. Those are my three takeaways for you. Hmm? Um, hi, sorry, just to add on to that, if you're looking at like consulting and finance jobs, there's an app, it's also a website called Debut, which is great for that, so yeah. <laughs> great, thanks. <laughs> Uh, I would just say, do your readings. Um, I get this price most of the time. I often find myself highlighting um, companies I found out in my readings. Um, that's really interesting because most, so especially if you take contemporary ones, like most of these places are even startups and they're, you, you know what they're working on, you know their projects, so uh, they like to hear that you've read on them. So why not just, yeah, Google them and send them an email? Yeah, uh, yeah sort of building up on that, I think also kind of, having very like specific but also broad google searches like that's how i found the i didn't know there were latin american ngos in london i just didn't think that was a thing until i googled i was like latin american ngos in london then like five things came up and i'm in contact with all of them um so i think also sort of knowing your interest um there's no harm in like googling the most random thing if you're taking a module on security in latin america and consult like a um, canning house for example they're like a think tank um, and also a consultancy firm for a uh, European investment in Latin America. And it's one of those things that you're not going to find out unless you either ask your professors, look on LinkedIn or just Google these things. And then uh, I know it sounds super like lame, but I think it's so important to know that there are so many different jobs and so many different NGOs and think tanks, uh, policy institute and lobbying that you wouldn't even think of unless you actually sort of take the time to do your proper research. Yeah, yeah, and I just like to add. Um, so the bulk of my work experience has been been through Kings, and that's where I found it through my email. Um, but also check Kings Career Connect and Kings Talent Bank is also a very valuable resource. Um, not only could you find like a summer internship there, they if you're looking to work part time during the year, they offer part time work. You know, whether it be like for three, six, or nine months, um, there's just so much um, available there. Um, and in terms of if you're interested in like media or journalism, Media Beans is a really great resource. Um, you can find traineeships, internships, full time jobs, and I think they send a newsletter every month or so. Um, and Creative Access is also really, really um, good. I've looked through that a lot and I'm, I'm, high, I'm taking a gap year um, before I apply for a master's and I'm looking um, for jobs there a lot. So if you are um, in like the BAME community, um, they offer jobs, internships, whatever, uh, exclusively for you. Amazing, thank you so much. And I think this kind of builds a bit onto it because I think it's also really important to acknowledge how something as society work through the university also can, or like even if you work at a cafe, a, a bar in retail, something like that. I also work in retail just to get a bit of extra cash in London, which is very needed sometimes. Um, and I think it's also about like translating those skills. So not necessarily saying, okay, yes, I can brew a really nice cup of coffee. But, but being like, oh, but I'm really good at working under pressure. I'm very flexible. I really enjoy working in um, group settings or something like that. And it's like you can even find pages on uh, on the Google, for example, that helps you translate these skills saying, OK, what have I learned here? Because it's very generic in a sense. But if you're really good at actually translating that, whether that's in an interview or in the CV, you kind of like have those specific buzzwords. You also have some overused buzzwords, but if you can actually prove and come with some really good examples of how you work under pressure or how, how you have your flexibility or use your um, your nationality, something like that um, in an international setting, that's really good. Um, yeah, and again, society work, I know international relations society and Warsaw society are both looking for members uh, for next year, slowly at least. Mm -hmm. um, so do also, if you're interested. <laughs> I'll add on that note, um, for first years specifically, joining a society can be a great way to network, which again, so important. Um, and an example that comes to mind is, so you can, when you put up events, you can recruit speakers, um, and then you become the person and point of contact for those speakers. You then add them on LinkedIn, you keep up to date with their activities, and if you end up applying to a company that, let's say, they're on a board of advisors for, you can name drop them. Even something as simple as that, um, which which is really generally a useful skill. Like we had a guy who was the head in, uh, head of security at MI6 um, at one of our events, and he was on the board of advisors for like this security and cyber based hedge fund where I applied for a job. And like, it, yeah, so these things work out. You never know. Like, there's value in every single thing you do in uni. The other thing I'll say, just on the previous question, is do not be afraid to shoot your shot. Like, 
don't just apply through the job portal. Mm -hmm. Google the management, Google who the hiring recruiter is for that specific company, find their name, find their email, RocketReach, brilliant website, it generates free email IDs for people and even phone numbers. Be best, like just <laughs> keep, keep, make mm -hmm. sure they know your name so that when they see an email from you, they know your CD is gonna be in that. Like, mm -hmm. I, I got a job for after uni literally by emailing every single person in a position of management at a very small fund, but they all knew who I was. And my first day there, I went there in person, they're like, oh, it's you, cool. Um, so yeah, just don't be afraid. The worst thing that can happen is you won't get a response. Or the actual worst thing that'll happen is they'll say, stop emailing me. Like that's it. <laughs> there, there nothing else. Um, so definitely do that. And also on job boards, um, sign up to every single job board you can um, and filter them all to like different levels, if that makes sense, that you can usually filter by sector and by start date. Um, so definitely do that. Indeed.com, great resource. Target jobs, great resource. And then everything that everyone said here uh, is what I've had. Amazing, thank you so much. Um, and kind of building on this, because this, do you guys have any tips on writing personal statements uh, or like motivational letters, uh, CV especially as well, which I know, yes. for example, banking and mm -hmm. consulting are very harsh with. Um, maybe you could also talk a bit about like the very long process yeah. of, of, getting, of going into one of those internships, for example. Um, yeah? I would just say that you touched on this a little bit. With the, with the CV, especially if you get more and more experience, but even in the beginning, there's nothing wrong with versatility, but you have to have those threads that run throughout. If you have those threads that run throughout, you can always bring everything back in to regardless of what your experience is. So regardless of how varied it might be, it might be something like international management. For me, that was a big part because people would look at my CV and be like, wow, you've been in four different fields. And I would say somewhat, but these are the threads that have run through all of them. And it actually allows me to do that at a higher level and a more versatile environment. So you can recover from that type of uh, confusion with the, with the CV. And there is something to be said for versatility. Uh, and, and versatility, you know, especially when you're dealing with, with smaller firms, a lot of times it's sort of all hands on deck. So there is something to be said for that, but on the other hand, you do want to have those threads that go all the way through. Yeah, any other Yeah, ones? I was just going to say, how many of you guys struggle to write your resume? Raise your hands. I totally do. Um, whether it's formatting or actually writing it, it's a pain. Um, because every single place that you apply, they're going to ask for something different. So you're going to want to tailor your resume, and that can be a dread. Specifically because you're like, oh, they didn't hire me because of my format or something. You're like, and now I have to write this cover letter and it's all a pain. But there's actually this really good website that's called Resume Builder. I feel like I'm advertising for them, but <laughs> it's really good. They have so many different kinds of templates there uh, when it comes to CVs, when it comes to cover letters and things like that. So you don't miss a single detail because there might be something small such as like, I don't know, I guess you didn't put your phone number like right or something, but it's so easy for you there to edit your resume and to make many different kinds of copies. Because I know like editing your resume in Word, that's not going to work because I know some companies literally take a rule and measure your bullet points to see if they're actually aligned, which is a pain. They told me. Um, but if you use this website, they can actually help you with that. So all you have to do is actually just write the content. You don't have to focus about the formatting or anything because it's quite easy to do it. Uh, the same thing when it comes to cover letters, uh, you can change a few words. And also, you know, when you're applying to like an internship or a job and you see the description of what that is, most likely they're going to want you to have some kind of mention of that in your resume. So again, if you also work at like a coffee shop or something like that and you're applying for a law firm or something, you can say, I worked under pressure. I am really a good team leader. I, I don't know, I can multitask, things like that, that they're looking for. Just tailor it to what they want to hear. And again, don't be afraid to sell yourself. When it comes to the interview, don't be nervous. They are also going, you have to choose them as well. So I would say prepare, don't stress too much. Make sure you know your resume in and out because it's yourself, you're trying to sell yourself and make sure that you're taking everything that you can take. Don't take more than you can take because otherwise you're going to come short. And don't be afraid to ask questions too. Yeah, and I just like to add, I think when I, whenever I've applied for an internship or a job, I spent almost as much time 
just reading and highlighting, taking notes on what the description is, what they're looking for, and what the role will entail. Um, pretty much as much time as I spend writing the personal statement or CV, because a lot of the times they'll just kind of look for those like key words that they put in the description. So it's really important that you tailor your application um, to specifically what they're looking for, even if that means like tweaking your resume for like a tenth time for like another application, it's worth it. Um, yeah, also not talking more about sort of uh, if you have absolutely no experience, if you come from just like I just I'm a first year, I'm taking history of the international systems class and mm -hmm. this is all I've done so far. Uh, I think also just talking about that, like talking about the projects that you've done, the kind of research that you've done. Um, I know a lot for like second years, like global politics extended essay that you got complete like autonomy of what you do it on and what kinds of uh, methods that you use if you've done archi archival work if you've done inter uh, in our internships interviews i know that in my case uh, my recruiter told me that's like yeah you, you talked a lot about like qualitative inter qualitative research methods through interviews that i just kind of freestyled for my essay because they don't teach you that i are but um that was also something like i kind of you know tweaked and talked about and why i did them and the methods that i did and i did them in english and in spanish which is you know, a lot of there's so many international uh, bilingual students in the war studies department. So you can talk about that. And if you use that for research, that looks impressive in and of itself. I know it sounds like second nature to a lot of us, but it is impressive uh, in London. So just if you have absolutely no experience, talk about that in your resume. And yeah, mm -hmm. um, I may take it up for now um, on FIMES applications. Um, as it's been mentioned, the CV screening is the most important part. Like, most people don't get past it, so once you receive the invitation to the hive, you, like, you should rejoice. You've actually passed the biggest um, narrowing down. And then the higher view, um, you should put some work into it because um, I've been told by HR people themselves that they review them several times, different people. They have your future manager, if, if any, like reviewing it. So um, it is important that you present yourself as clear, like with a structure even though you get like less than one minute it might be 15 seconds to plan an answer so it's, it's just it's not important what you, you're saying but rather that you just show you you're a good fit and that uh, you're willing to learn that's probably the most important part of an internship and then um, the interview itself um, I, I wouldn't consider it to be that big deal at least for um, this finance firms because like, once again um, they're pretty much certain at that point that they will hire you. Um, you you have several interviews with different people across the firm and I can tell you like sometimes they they're not even paying attention to you while you're talking um, so just focus on your high views and you see this going so let me say um, just one thing for the high views great tip is to you guys probably know this is to follow the star format um, because you have 30 seconds to read the prompt, and then you have 90 seconds or 100 seconds to give your answer. Um, and it can be something like, tell me about a time you overcame a challenge in the workplace, or like, tell me about a time a colleague gave you a difficult situation. Um, use the STAR method, which is describe the situation, task, action, response. It's just a really good way to structure your thinking within 90 seconds. And it's tough because we tend to ramble everyone that's specifically in interviews so yeah i'd say star all the way um, and when you're preparing in your notes just have sticky notes behind your computer as well when you're doing the high view because you're looking at a camera but you can easily like look up and just keep a column with s t a r different situations different tasks actions and responses because it's a really reassuring way you'll seem a lot more confident when you do it mm -hmm. amazing thank you so much i think also and if you have anything to add on this please feel free to do so but also part of the question is also what, what should you emphasize when you write a CV? And the thing is sometimes companies will ask, especially like for example in consulting or something, will ask for only like a one letter CV. So obviously you can't put all your experience down if you've worked in several different cafes, several different bars and also done a research internship, for example. So, so really do go in and read that specific like um, application portal or about the job and see, okay, what is it that they want from you and where can you kind of um, show that you have those skills that they would like to hear about or they feel like they can use. So that also means that you can't just have one CV from 15 years old and send that out to all the companies. You probably need to change it. You probably need to change it every year, every half a year when you're actively searching jobs 
for every application that we do. I would say it becomes easier. So when you slowly get the hang of it, have a really good format. Um, you can maybe even have, like I have that, like a, a long document of all the experience. And then I just, you know, um, copy paste whatever is right for that specific job that I'm um, applying for. So it, it does, it can easily take like a weekend for you to kind of like sit down and actually properly, properly work on that. But when you have it, you're going to be so happy with it. So that's a really, really good tip. So read what the application says, what kind of company is it, what kind of field is it, and how can you shape your current experience? And then have that like long document and just like copy paste it in because then you've already done the work and you just need to to um, make the layout basically. Just sorry, 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 please go ahead. Uh, just real quick, on the interview, one thing that, and looking at it from the standpoint of interviewing people who come to, come to my old firm, um, Everyone's going to be nervous when you go to the interview, right? I've gone to interviews right now, I'm overqualified, you go and you just, it's naturally a nerve wracking environment for whatever reason it is. But just the most important thing I think about it is, and I've seen people come in, I can tell they're nervous. They know all about you from your CV, right? They know, they already know this. They know what your limitations are, right? They, they understand you're still there for a reason, right? So don't self select. Don't start sitting there thinking, you know, hey, I shouldn't be here or whatever. Focus on what you can control. What you can control when you go in is your preparation, your attitude, and how you can get a, maybe you can find a way to differentiate yourself that isn't based on your experience. Very quickly, people would come into Northwestern. You have to have a six and a, a, a you have to have a, a six and a 63 investment license, and they, you can't get that unless you're at a firm. But one person I interviewed said, I, I already uh, she bought the um, basically the study guide. Ahead of time, he said she started looking at. It. That goes a long way because she's thinking very, very proactively. So there's ways to, to, to stick out. Don't self-select when you go in. This. Sometimes I see people come in and I feel like they're defeated before they, they even <laughs> open their mouth. They're just really scared. You're there for a reason. Yeah, I was just going to say, adding into that, um, just one last point. Um, it's important that in those interviews that you say, instead of saying, you know, being nervous about it, just say, if I was part of the team, I would be doing this. If I was part of our team, blah, blah, blah. Make sure you slowly tr transition into like them seeing you as part of the team because it's all about the environment. If you don't mesh well with them, they won't like you. So you kind of have to like sort of push this vision of like, if I work with you, I will be able to do this, this and that. Like, this is my resume, but this is what I can do for you. So if you have that vision going on throughout the whole interview, it looks really confident. And it also looks like you have actually put a lot of effort into researching the company beforehand. Yeah, and also um, during interviews, as per my experience, there's always been a, like a small section at the end where they ask you if you have any questions. Always come with at least like two or three questions prepared. Um, make sure like um, you research about the company. It's, it's always good to ask about the company itself or even to frame it kind of like as if you're already working for them. So, oh, if um, I'm here, could I embark on a project like this? Um, it shows that you're really invested um, in working with them. Uh, also, I think, I don't know how this would be for consultancy or finance, but I know for like NGO sectors, um, they're very like specific. And even if you get a rejection, a lot of the time, or it's happened to me where I just, I was so excited about the interview and I was genuinely really interested in the job that they did. And I, I mentioned that at the end. Um, and I was like, you know, I, I'm really interested in your job and you know, thank you for this interview. And they contacted me later, they were like, you didn't get the position that you applied for, but we're offering you this other position. Like, you don't have to interview anymore. I, was, I wasn't able to take it because it was full time during my third year and I was like, I can't, sorry. But I think just keeping in contact with them, um, like emailing them, being aware that you're interested in their projects. Um, you know, a, a rejection is not the end of the world, uh, especially if you went through a lot of stages of interviews. Um, they might still think you're still a great candidate, just not experienced enough or, you know, not in the right time. But always keep those doors open. Don't shut the, the doors. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, there are many reasons for rejection and now a lot of um, sponsorship, like visa sponsorship, which is mentioned. <laughs> and you have to be quite realistic about this. Um, if you cannot work in a country, chances are they will not give you the job. Yeah. So um, just make sure that you know where you can work. And try your utmost, but um, yeah, no rejections come out quite, like, quite easily. So. Yeah, on that note, a um, little tip for people, international students, Gov.uk UK website has a list of companies in the UK that are listed as visa sponsors, so that have the capacity to sponsor. So before you even apply for a job, this is more for entry level, but even for internships, 
cross-reference it with that list of companies to check if they can even do visa sponsorship. Um, because if they can't do the sponsorship visa, I, I can guarantee you, you're not going to get the job. Um, you can't. So, so yeah, just refer to that list and just keep it bookmarked on your computer um, because it's a really handy way. And just one thing about CVs, um, we, we've been saying, like, look at the field you're applying to and tailor your CV to that. But a way to, like, put that into practice is, for example, with banking, the language of people in finance is numbers. So make sure your CV has numbers everywhere. It could be something as simple as, oh, I was a temporary teacher at a school to 30 kids. Write 30 in the number. Um, I helped you with 50% profit for XYZ project or, like, I helped increase the capacity of the World Studies room by 62%. Like, just throw numbers in wherever you can. Mm -hmm. And the same thing with NGO sectors or like consultancies. Over there, it's all about KPI. What are your performance indicators? So like, use the language, familiarize yourself with the language of that field, and you can find endless blog articles about it. If you're going into communications, what kind of like, if you've worked on a presentation, call it a deck. Call it a slide deck, things like that. Just yeah, talk to people in the field as well. That's another really important thing. Use LinkedIn. Reach out to people at the company. Or usually the analyst level is a good level to contact um, because they're, they'll be the junior most in the company. Talk to them about like what the culture is like. Generally, try to get like ask what's a cool upcoming project, and then in your higher view, name drop that project. So things like that as well. Um, but yeah, definitely tailor your CV to the language and like the jargon of the field and the company. Yeah. And if you're really good at networking, like if you become confident within LinkedIn, then find King's alumni or yeah. War Studies alumni, like from the department, that now work in, like for IISS or even work at yeah, Goldman Sachs or wherever, because they're more than happy to help. Mm -hmm. Like just imagine if if someone reached out to you on LinkedIn and asked, hey, I can see that you do this master's program. Um, would you be interested in like telling me a bit more about it or something like that? And like, I think most people in here would actually be quite happy to help, um, especially if it doesn't take ages to, to answer, um, and it usually doesn't. So, so do definitely shape it that way, and you know, find that relation. Be like, hey, I'm also in the horse that is department. Let's let's connect, um, or invite them out for a virtual cup of coffee, or maybe even meet up with them if they're in London. Um, doesn't need to be that extensive. It can also just be a very very short LinkedIn message. Um, that's how I reached out to some of the panelists today. So, um, so it does work. Um, cool. Do we have any questions from the panel now? Um, and also have a think about it. Otherwise, we do have a couple more in the chat. Yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned a lot of networking and just like getting in touch with people, but like that first email is a bit daunting. So, do you have any tips on what to include in that first email when you're reaching out to someone new or? On LinkedIn, you know, like what do you include in the first message? No. Um, yeah, I totally agree. I mean, I think when I was a first year, I'd heard like network, and I'm like, okay, but, but where? Like, do I just like go to the street and be like, are you interested in networking? Like, what 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 even is networking? I think the main thing is just like go to events, like go to war study society events, go to like um, different kings. Like kings hold so many events for so many different things. Uh, if you're interested in some sort of like society, even outside, like they. KCLSU makes a lot of events with like the Society of LSE or like the, the Diplomacy Society of LSE and UCL, for example. You'd go to the, that sort of thing and then you talk to other people, other committees, and then they tell you like, oh, like I know you're really interested in, I don't know, political economy of gender and development. Like I know someone that does that. But I think you just kind of have to go to some events. Uh, and then from there, I'd be like, well, I talked to this person for five minutes. I just said my name and I was like, oh, I like your work. You can email them and at least you can mention like, oh, we met in person. You know, this is blank and I study at King's. And that in and of itself, you have already sort of, you're already kind of like one foot in, you know? Yeah, Hannah? Yeah, I'd also say you can be as easy as office hours. Your professors want to talk to you about their career, their research, and they want to help you. They're there to help you with um, your studies um, and your career. I think the first time I networked was with one of my professors last year. And it was as simple as being like, hey, I know you have office hours um, like next week on Tuesday. Could I just chat to you? I know you worked in journalism for a while. I mean, we still like have, um, I guess, like a connection where we chat once in a while. I keep him up to date on stuff and he gives me advice when I need to. So it can be, yeah, start as small as office hours. Yeah, and it can also be some that are not your professors mm -hmm. or it can be like I reached out to, I'm Danish, so I reached out to a Danish seminar leader that another 
group had like she wasn't my seminar leader but i still reached out to her and we had a chat um just like in the teachers room we had kings so it's, it, it can be that easy and sometimes if it's not your professor they can take a bit <laughs> bit of time to get back to you but but they will most likely get back to you especially if you have you know something to say um and you can find all their profiles um online yeah yeah i was just gonna say if in the case like i don't know you don't meet them in person or something but you do find them in linkedin they have a connection with you make sure you say hi i noticed we have a connection with blah 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 I'm actually really interested in the work that you do because blah, 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 I do this, that, and that. I think I'd be great asset, blah, blah, So you can introduce yourself by saying, like, this is why I'm reaching out. Like, not just being like, hi, I'm a stranger. Or if you're like, hey, I'm familiar with your work. I really love this. I would love to know more about it. Would it be possible to set up, like, a small, like, meeting or something like that? It's just, I know it might seem scary, but they're more than happy to talk to you, like, even like us as panelists, if you guys want to talk to us, like we're all students, like if you want to get like get us coffee or we can get coffee <laughs> together if you want, like that's totally fine. Like people love talking about themselves. So if you indulge them into that, I think you should be fine. Like it's just take the first step. Like don't be scared. Like seriously, people are very nice. And if they're not, it's okay. There's plenty of other people out there too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I've, just, I've had some issues with the whole timing period of like, I keep on missing deadlines for applications or they're like, you know, mixed with my school, like uni work, and I just miss them or like I don't have enough time to do them. So when, when did you guys find the time to do it? Like, when is the right time to apply to these things or to look into them? <laughs> yes. Um, I, so I would say one year before. Yeah. And as in, I didn't mean applying or planning your application, just if you've missed it, just set a reminder for next year. Um, and because besides, like, I missed the first year banking um, opportunities just because of that. Um, so do plan it in advance. And even so, uh, because I feel like they're all separate. So as in, you know, banking and consultancy come in first, then some others, and then finally, You've got uh, the King's Bones, for instance, right? So you probably may. Um, you, you keep finding opportunities, so don't be discouraged by you having missed the deadline. I'm just going to say something. So when somebody texts you, right? You see the text, by the way. Make sure that you put the application deadlines in your phone. Like, if you put them in your calendar and you put that as a reminder, there is no excuse. Maybe put it, like, 10 days ahead or something days ahead. Like. Make sure you get organized right away because even though you might feel overwhelmed with university work, that you also need to be organized with. So you can organize your academic life and also your professional life um, together as long as, you know, if you have this calendar set, you won't miss a deadline. Um, and if you do miss, if you think you're going to miss it again, maybe set many other alarms or tell your like parents like, hey, like remind me this, like that this is coming up soon, like just text me. Um, because I think it's just kind of like you just have to be on the lookout for that. And if you really, really care about a job, just like you care about your academic work, you will make time for it. So just make sure you put that in your calendar, in your phone, and computer too, or iPad, whatever. Or you know, you have your watch too as well. I would say, if just strictly speaking, from a security standpoint, or military things that age, the timeline for military government is really, really stretched out. So because you might be dealing with access, security. Uh, might be dealing with security clearances. If they, sometimes internships will give you like an interim clearance. Any military I work with is not efficient at all, especially <laughs> administratively speaking. So I would say with that, you're looking at nine to 12 months, give or take. Mm -hmm. That's perfectly fine. Um, and even then, it might not, might, you might have some issues. So you can never be too early with them. Yeah. Uh, I think also just sort of like for me, I know that if I write something down in my planner, like it depends on like what kind of job you're applying for but for and like charities again um they're not usually that strict you don't have to prepare for it for a year but they do have sort of like on like rolling basis like we take people in in november and then again in march uh, and if you miss that you know that's it um so just like you write it down over and over and over and over again and if you in my case i applied in november the day after the deadline for the november thing had closed um, and I was like, I didn't hear back from them for like six weeks. So I was like, I'm, I didn't get it. Like, it's fine. And then they contact me in January. Like, I got a random call and they're like, oh yeah, do you want to do the interview now? And I was like, 
Okay, sure. So I think it depends on which sector. I know a lot of, a lot of sectors are a lot more um, strict, but I think just keeping it in mind, writing it, writing it down, putting it all over, you sort of like saturate yourself with the deadlines. Um, and if you miss it, you know, it's not the end of the world. Yeah. Yeah, um, I, yeah. I have a, I have, I'm a very forgetful person in general, so I understand like missing application deadlines. But I think what worked for me is I had one central hub where I listed all the internships and jobs I was applying to, and I made sure I had in really, really big, bold, highlighted um, text when the application date was, and I planned my schedule around that for um, a few months as I was applying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So definitely, like, use Excel if you use Notion. Get like a nice spreadsheet and if you're like super structured then get the name maybe a link to the to the place the deadline and maybe also what they're looking for because then you know exactly what to for example put in your cv if they require a motivational letter if if you need to interview and like prepare for the interviews beforehand and again let's say you then miss something for this year but you're like oh but i'm um in my uh, second year so maybe i could do it for like summer next year or something like that or they have another round then add that and then you can always go back and that's the importance of also having a central hub so like gathering your notes and sticky notes and stuff and, and making sure that you know where to look for it uh, i also have so many places saved on my laptop just like a bookmark um, that i sometimes then go through when i remember to do so um, because that's also the thing about finding internships. It's, it's when you hear about people doing something cool, you're like, oh, I didn't know I could go into maritime security risk intelligence. That sounds interesting. Let me hear more about that. And then you figure out, oh, OK, this is actually a rolling application, so I can just send it. Um, because it often takes longer to apply than you you would think. It, it's almost like a small essay yeah. deadline. Um, yeah, so do take the time and do remember to prioritize it as well yeah. um, and and that's okay if you need to spend one or two or many more days on on sending uh, I have I live with a business student and she spent months applying for a consulting internship she ended up getting it which was great but she also spent so much time doing it um, but but that was worth it in the end um, yeah I will also just say can I just ask you uh, do you ask the question yeah yeah what sector are you looking at uh, this was this was for for long. And for long. But a lot of it was like you know I was thinking, hey, let me try to get into it. Right. And um, you know you start looking at it because you know I thought like hey I can six months before summer yeah. I'll look at it now. And yeah. you look at it and it's like oh the application is twenty fourth of January. Yeah. yeah. And there's like six days left and you're like how am I going to do an application in six sure. days? Yeah. So that's why I was like I'm just going to wait and then maybe take a whole year to apply for the, yeah. for the year after. Um, I will say for law specifically, but also for finance consultant, again, we have to keep in mind we're in London, like <laughs> these, these things will come up. Um, there are websites that do the work for you. So you will have an aggregated list of sector within sector company and then deadline season and deadline deadline date. Um, and I, I can't give you names right now off the top of my head, but just go home, literally just Google it. Um, for like deadline for law companies London mm -hmm. and you have an Excel spreadsheet with input that's changed year by year. Sometimes it's not as updated, but if not for this year, then even for next year or if there's like a summer slot, um, it's really useful to have those like well in advance and then then you do adding in your dates. But if you don't want to go through the work of like going to every company, looking at the deadline date, putting it in your calendar, that, that exists. Like just, just Google best friend, yeah. And the law society is also, do you do, do law? International law. Okay, international law. Because they have, then I don't know how relevant it is, but they, for example, have like law for non-law students, where mm -hmm. they kind of like talk you through like commercial awareness, stuff like that, how the application process works. Um, so like, that, depending on what you want to do, I guess you're doing it now with four studies and IR, yeah. uh, but like go to your societies of what you're interested in and they will definitely help you out. Like we, and we have a website of like different NGOs that you can apply to and think tanks within uh, uh, both like within Europe, within the like North America, specifically for Finland, I think my co-president is Finnish, so you may want to use it for. Finland, um, good for him. Um, yeah, so, so do have a look at that if think tanks, for example, is something that you're interested in. I don't know, is, do you have yeah, something? Also for law specifically, um, having dealt with the law department and their staff a lot, they're great. So if you want to talk to them, they're going to help you out a lot. Like a bunch of professors have actually worked as lawyers, especially in international law. Um, Dr. Phil Bogart is a great contact. I appreciate you know her. But yeah, they're very approachable. They might seem very intimidating because they're really smart. 
So go to them, talk to them, they're gonna help you out for sure. Yeah. Amazing. Any any other questions? Yeah. Um how honest are you in your applications? <laughs> <laughs> so I like I've got a friend who he applied for a job and he was like, Oh yeah, I was like a choir boy and I volunteer at three different charities every week and he did none of those things but he got the job, so it was like <laughs> I don't give a shit, quite frankly. Um, whereas I feel like perhaps I have a stronger moral compass than him, I don't know, but I feel slightly more uh, reserved about lying. But I guess there's a fine line between lying and I suppose embellishing from what you've done. How far would you like recommend you do that? Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. I would say, like, because I'm still a student, so there's not much. I want to lie about or like try to pretend that I know or like have experience. Um, but this past year, I had the opportunity to go visit the BBC monitoring where they do like research um, for input into like articles all around the world. And one of the main pieces of, of advice we got from a journalist who works there is that they will test you about what you say you're proficient in. So, for example, she said she was fluent in Italian, um, French, and some other languages. They fully tested her in every language. So I did just don't lie. Because um, you don't want to like show up to an interview um, and just not know what you're talking about. I would look. I first of all I totally agree with that. The first thing to do is don't lie, right? But the other thing too is you you can have if you have a job where you were an operations manager, right? You were the only operations manager for this small mom and pop place that you worked for, right? You're the only one. Are you the senior operations manager <laughs> or are you the operations manager? Personally, I did that. I called my old boss and I'm like, come on, man. I'm the only operator. I'll be the best guy. And he's like, I got you. That was it. Did I know the job? Yes. Did I, was I able to, to, to you know, tell them exactly what, you know, I, I proved my qualifications, but that little title may have helped me out a little bit because he probably had a lot of ops managers. So I wouldn't lie, but I would say, you know, if, if it's something that I think it might be something like that, that it's harmless and that you could construe that I was technically that person because just me, that's the judgment call on your part. So two different ways to look at it. Yeah. Any other on that? Or do we agree? Yeah. Can I think I just come back on that. Yes, of course. Yeah. Um, so if, like from my perspective, it's like the most difficult thing is like if you're applying to some sexy internship at some glorious organization we all want to work for, there's going to be hundreds, if not thousands, of people who have got a first class degree at a decent university who have done some volunteering work or whatever. And like from my friend's perspective, he, he was like, it just gets me into the interview. And then once you're in the interview, then you sell yourself in a sense. Um, but in order to get over that initial hurdle, he was quite comfortable lying because it would get him through that. And so that's kind of my question as well. Like if you're I, I, I'm not saying I lie, <laughs> but then it, I kind of feel like I'm running into a brick wall on every application because I feel like I'm not getting into the constant. I don't have experience. I'm like, well, mm -hmm. give me some then. Like, um, but yeah, I mean. Yeah, I was going to say just um, based on that. So never say that you don't have experience because your experience is different. So I feel like that was like something that I struggled with when I was applying for jobs because I was like, I don't have any experience. But then I was like, I just went to like university. I did a bunch of research on so many other things. I have experience. You have some kind of experience that you have to show. You can show that and say, I throughout university, I was involved in this society and this and that. I worked with like, again, logistics. I created this conference. I did that. That is experience. Just because somebody didn't pay you, it doesn't mean that it wasn't experience. Again, so you're not lying that you didn't have experience. So if you're looking for some kind of like experience or something like that, that's like very basic, get involved with like the university, like go to these student clubs, become like the treasurer of like, I don't know, like chess society or, or something like that, or like some kind of volleyball something or, you know, um, just do something that you can expand your skills, you can push your employers, you can also work with your teammates because you did work with your team. You organize that. That's the same thing that they're asking you to do. It's the same experience, but it's different because you did it through your university. That doesn't mean that your experience is not valid. 
at the same time, if you do feel like you should lie about it, then maybe you should think, mm, should I get more involved in like other things in school and how you should phrase it? Like if you want to do something in finance, why not get involved in like something small, like like a society at school that does like, and you know, get run for the position of finance. Like why not manage your budget? Like that's still managing a budget, you know? It's the same thing that they're asking you to do in these internships and in these jobs. It's exactly the same thing, just the way you put it. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so uh, obviously you cannot lie about your core skills, the, the core skills for the job, because you'll get tested for them. But then if you, what you're looking for is kind of embellishing your background to a bit more memorable, then you definitely have more choices to choose from other than lying. As in, for instance, in my Goldman interview, at that time I was also applying to the British Bake Off. And I told them about it. I spent a good five minutes just telling them about how it was going. And in the end, I was like, oh, if I end up getting into Goldman, I'll join the Goldman Baking Society. And then that was memorable for them because I, 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 I talked to my recruiter and she was like, when, when are you baking for me? And I was like, well, yeah. So you yeah. can be memorable in other ways. <laughs> <laughs> Don't steal Rajas, though. <laughs> <laughs> That's his. Um, yeah, I think you should you shouldn't lie about who you are. I think there are parts about you that you don't think are like relevant for the job or interesting enough to mention in the job. But um, I mean, I think I mentioned sort of like your academic skills and what you're interested in and what essays you've written. And I think that that in of itself, if you put down, I think I have on my resume right now, like the kind of research I did for the extended essay and the research I'm doing now for my dissertation. Um, and that is like you're showing, you're linking that to your professional skills. You're talking about your academic achievements, and you also talk about your personal interests and how all of those are connected. Um, and that makes you think sort of an interesting um, person that's applying for the job. Um, so if you know the British Bake Off is really cool, Roger. I can reject it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got to the last part. He of made the it a final yeah. round though. Oh wow! Uh, Bake Off. Still got rejected. <laughs> but we we can't all be as poor as Roger. So yeah. if you talk about you know yeah. some essay that you wrote, or if you I know that for investment banking as well, people show me that if you say that you've ran a marathon, if you've ran a marathon, mm -hmm. you mention that in your CV, that makes people like ask you about it. I'm like, oh, that's a really cool experience. It shows dedication. And you know that's not particularly related to, related to global markets mm -hmm. and equity, but it's still cool, right? So. And I think maybe also networking here comes in. I don't know about like the huge like for example within banking consultancies, they can maybe help you with your CV and the application itself. But for example, I don't know if you received that email about like it's this Oxford research group within some defense something something. You can find it in your emails. Um, but for example, one of the email that was linked to that, where you can ask questions, I realized, oh, we actually did an event with her. She's a uh, War Studies alumni, and War Studies Society did an event with her last year. So I was like, oh, maybe I'll just reach out to her and, you know, ask some questions about it and uh, be like, hey, yeah, we met last year. And and I know, obviously, you can't always do that. But but again, that kind of like brings me back to saying, oh, maybe because King students are everywhere, and especially from the Department of War Studies, they're super attractive to Stuff like double I double S Chatham House, um, Oxford research groups and defense and stuff. So I think if you if you can sell yourself is exactly on what you have written essays on, what you have if you have been published on a student magazine, which we have plenty of, mm -hmm. um, like International Relations Today, for example, or um, Stripe. Stripe, yeah, for example. There are so many both for MA and, and undergrads and, and everything, uh, like for everyone. Um, so stuff like that makes it specialized and you obviously can't write an article or essays about everything but if it's a job that just happened to be within your specific academic interest then you can kind of like mm, i guess make your application stand out a bit because i'm sure that no one else of their applicants have written exactly the same essay as you have well they shouldn't have that's plagiarism <laughs> um and we don't like that um yeah any add-ons, any questions? Otherwise we might have a few online. Uh, we have one COVID related. So I'll just read out. In the situation of COVID-19 pandemic, if each of you have, has had an impact on the internship in your contribution to the organization, what are they? Please, would you describe how this has affected you? For example, any limitation? Mm -hmm. So I guess that's working during during COVID. Well, I was gonna say, um, for that, sorry, I just like jumped in, but, um, it was so interesting because last summer when it was COVID, 
I was like looking for jobs, looking for internships, applying to like, um, I guess, stuff to do like in general with my life because I was having like existential crisis. Uh, and I actually ended up working two jobs at the same time that were in different time zones. So again, you have to be very, very organized to pull it off. So I pulled it off most days, but some days like, you know, it was kind of like complicated. So I would say like COVID in a way like enabled me to do a lot of things that I wouldn't have been able to do otherwise. Cause like one job was in California and another one job was in DC. So they were very different. Um, also like one was about politics, the other one was about lobbying, but I still did both of them. I managed to do both of them. So I would say don't take COVID as like, oh, I can't do anything because COVID because that's not really the case. Like everybody's still moving on with their lives. There's different ways to engage with it. And I wouldn't say that COVID is something that's like hindering your experience in comparison to other people because we've lived with it for two years. So, and I don't know if it's gonna stop. Hopefully it stops soon. Um, but it's still, if it still goes on, like we're gonna have to live in this way. And we have to learn how to connect with people virtually. And you guys do it every day when you have high flex classes or you go to online events things like that. So I like, you know, don't limit yourself to saying like, oh, it's an online internship, like whatever, just put it online. No, it's like a huge privilege because as we said, like we were struggling with technology right now. That's a skill right there to like actually know how to work like a computer, like teams and all that. That's a skill. So take that as a privilege. You can work anywhere, wherever you want very flexible, but also make sure you're very organized because it might not be the best for your health, not having like a difference between your job and your home. Um, so I would say keep that in mind. So one thing you can do on that, I think with COVID, it, it forces people to get really creative and, and you have a lot of time, or you have more time to do things you normally wouldn't prioritize as much. So when we had training at one of my jobs, if something happened and the training fell through, we would have what's called hip pocket training, which is basically someone in the room would at very quickly put together a training for the group, right? It would be like right on the spot. No one ever thought to go back and actually codify all of that and capture it in manuals so that when you did need it in the future, you had that manual, you had a training manual ready to go. So during COVID, we did that. We actually went back and we put all that stuff that was great ideas, a lot of good institutional knowledge, but we actually put it in hard copies started backing up a lot of systems because we didn't have this problem before. So you, you have to look at, it's almost like sometimes with COVID, you have to look at it as like, all right, what have we really been putting off? We should probably do, and it will have some you know, value down the road because we'll probably deal with this again at some point. Yeah, and I'd just like to add, so I had two internships last summer um, when COVID was pretty bad, um, and I found it was to my advantage, um, especially like as an international student who was working in the summer, I didn't really want to stay in London the whole summer. I wanted to go home and being able to work online completely was really, really flexible for me. I could travel to see my family. I was able to take vacations as well, stuff that I wouldn't be able to do um, if everything was full time based in London. So if you see something that's online, yeah, it's not something that's necessarily bad. You can fit your, the rest of your life around it. I think also sort of seeing it from the other point, like I really liked the ability of like remote working. Um, but I think in my specific case, I wasn't able to work for like after I got the job in January 2021 till April, basically because the restrictions of COVID and I was walking, working with vulnerable groups. So they were just like, yeah, you're hired, but you know, we don't know when you're going to start working. Um, and that can feel really like nerve wracking as like a first experience. Um, and that was a sort of big limitation. But I think also on the other hand of that, like on the sort of the positive side of that is that this job emerged out of COVID. It was a sort of workshop to help elderly women transition into Zoom so they can be in contact with their friends, which is like super wholesome. Um, but that job wouldn't have existed if like, it wouldn't have been as urgent if COVID hadn't happened. So I think it's important to keep in mind that COVID has also given so many people so many other jobs that you didn't think were important until now. The transition is sort of high flex in tech um, in things as NGOs. Um, so, you know, yeah. Yeah, and I think also something about I don't know how many international students there are here, but like use your background. So I was I was in Denmark for quite a while last year and, and I ended up getting so the Danish um, Atlantic Association, which is really interesting. So how you can actually use that because they're super interested in what oh wow, why are you over here studying? And I'm like, Oh, because you can't do international politics in Denmark and they're like, Oh, really interesting. We're interested in you. Um so like either because you are 
in your home country or you're here, like you can definitely use your national background or if you know like a second or third or tenth language, like that's always something that that you can kind of like use and also to stand out. Um, and I think also like now with COVID, we are so much more used and flexible to yeah the hybrid version. So even if you do an internship, they're like, oh, maybe you work like half of half of it will be from home and then you come into the office once a week mm -hmm. or uh, maybe you're 100 percent online. So you could get that one internship, even though it's in India and you're here. Um, but because you can work hybrid, that, that would be fine. Um, yeah, so that's definitely something that COVID is like one of the more positive sides. Then it could be that, be that you're just like me and don't really like working from home. I like to be on location. That's then another thing, but it definitely has introduced some flexibility into not only internships and but also like work life in, in general, I assume. Yeah. Cool. Um, I think I will ask because we have been sitting here for one and a half hours. Thank you so much for staying, everyone. Also online, uh, we're still on 115 participants, which is great. Wow. Um, so, if you have any last questions, do you think about them now? Also for you guys online, and then I will ask the panelists if you have like what is your best tip for finding an internship or getting work experience. Let's say. You don't really have that much. You maybe have again a little bit experience or none at all. But how do you get into it? What's your best tip? I don't know who wants to start. <laughs> it's a big question, Kayla. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Any other questions? No, I, I would just say let's just like, attack it with a lot of energy, yeah. a lot of honesty. I, I I think the first person I talked to, I said I, I I know how successful you are, and I I think I literally said I want to be more like you. I just, <laughs> I just I remember like saying it like where I'm like I kind of want what you got. And, and they liked the idea that I just came out with that and, and I was enthusiastic and I told them all the things I could do that had nothing to do with experience. And again, reverse mode, me seeing people come in and talking to them, it's the same thing I look for. Good attitude, good preparation. I know you don't have a lot of experience. And just be persistent. I know you guys have mentioned this before. Don't, don't get discouraged. Do not get discouraged. Stay positive. It'll happen. Mm -hmm. I would also add quality over quantity, which is obvious, but like if you're applying, it's very easy to just apply to many places and kind of forget about them. Just, you know, devote your best to a few of them and then chances are you'll actually get an interview for them. So you don't want to see like a really long list of rejections. <laughs> it might be better just to have five, which you need a couple of interviews for and then just you know, get the job. Um, I think my biggest tip is um, Join societies. I know it's been said here before, but don't join a society just so you can put like, oh, I'm a treasure mm -hmm. of this on your CV. Join a society where you can show your skills and where you can show that you've produced your own content. So, for example, um, like when I was first applying for internships, the only experience I had practically was I babysat in high school. Um, but I could talk about how much I wrote for Roar News, which is a student newspaper here. I could go on and on about all the different articles, the research I did. So I think what's most important is like starting small and really, really, really knowing what you're talking about with the little you had or you have. Yeah. Um, I think from in my case, I think do your research on what kind of jobs you'd like. It was mentioned before, like going on LinkedIn and looking at people's profiles, looking at King's alumni as well. Um, you know, I think we tend to undersell like undersell ourselves and understand like like King's is a very attractive university. IR is a really great field in King's War Studies as well. Um, it's incredibly broad. You could do anything that you can want from a feminist NGO to investment banking. Um, it depends on what you think you'd be good at, what you'd like to sort of go like go in. And uh, yeah, just do full research on what you like to do in quality over quantity. Um, so yeah, that'd be my biggest tip. Uh, I was going to say just be curious. Never lose that curiosity. It's always good to wonder and to see and you know you might like something like you know you're very curious when you do your readings and you highlight something like actually look at that like show genuine interest i know we have so many different kinds of societies like sometimes like there's some sectors that are like more like less friendly towards women but there's like societies at kings for example the women in pol um women in politics and international studies that works with that transition of like what do you do when you're the only woman in the room like it might be uncomfortable, but you know, know that you also have people that have gone through that. You're not the only one. But again, you would never know that if you're not curious, if you don't look at things. Like, just make sure that you never stop asking questions and that you always wonder, what if? That's the only tip that I can give you guys. 
Amazing. Any any last questions? Yeah. Hello, sorry. Yeah. Um, if you're like interested in an area, is that just all you apply for in a sense? Um, or would you recommend applying for anything that's vaguely related just so it can go on your CV? And, um, because I like I finished my masters now and done my dissertation and everything, and I would like to continue working in what I did my dissertation in, but like it's really difficult to do that. <laughs> so should I keep plugging away at that, or should I like branch out, do something different, and then come back to that? I mean, I, I don't know. I, I I'm interested to hear what everyone says. Obviously, I, I would say complementary would be good. Something that's complementary would be okay. I don't know if I would get too far outside of what you're trying to do. So if it's a related field, to me that makes sense. Um, personally, that's what I would do. Yeah, I mean, uh, adding on to that, like, I mean, I'm doing my master's right now, but as I'm applying to more jobs, um, something that I'm looking at is, for example, like if I want to work for a think tank, and I work for a lobbying firm, like I just look at the different like departments that we have so if those are like the same, like in common, like government, politics, the Americas, Southeast Asia, something like that, if that's in common, that's fine. Because you're still like, even though they're different sectors, it's still like something that you're still interested in and that shows some kind of continuity. So as long as you find that, that's fine. But for example, if you go from like, I don't know, like you're studying war studies and then you go into marketing for like, um, I don't know, an underwear, company or something like that. That's kind of like, unless you want to work in their global sector, that makes more sense. But at the same time, it's like, there's all these companies in the in the public sector and the private sector that also have like governance under it. Um, they also have like some kind of like international component. So I would look at that and not necessarily just go like completely thrown out of it. Because even if you want to work on like, if you're interested in marketing, look at foreign like, I don't know, the economy, it's like foreign policy, something like that, that they have some kind of marketing department. So look at the organization and the umbrella side of it. And I think for me, like a lot of what I've been doing has been research related one way or another, whether that's for the university or think bank. And what I'm looking to do now, both like internship wise, but also like maybe professionally, is that I realized that I maybe would rather go into some more practical work within security and defense. Um, which is very, un like, that's a very broad umbrella just by itself. But what I then say is that, okay, I've, because I've done a couple of interviews where I've then said, okay, I, I have this experience in academia and I really enjoyed doing research and I'm, I'm getting really good at it also just through, like, doing it next to my studies. But what I'm excited to do is could kind of, like, translate what I now know um, into some more, like, and, and get some, like, practical experience as well. So I think that's one way of doing it also because I'm not saying that it's easy to go into research or academia at all, but, for example, your connections through King's, there's so many, again, ways of getting publicized, and, of course, it needs to be some proper stuff that you kind of, like, give out to the world, um, but that's at least, like, one way of showing you have some experience and that you have really engaged with the topic, really challenged what is currently going on, um, and kind of like show continued interest. Um, and you can do that whilst you're applying for some more maybe practical stuff. I don't know what exactly it is that you're interested in. Uh, but that's at least like one way of doing it um, to kind of like, again, translate the skills that you've gained. Yeah, I would say one thing. I really like what Rob said about the CV and the CRUD. Um, for me personally, as long as there's a way to demonstrate and in practice as well, see that there's some sort of transferable skill or learning from what I want to do eventually, and I'm not being able to do to what I'm doing currently applying to, I'm okay with it. So as long as there's something I can take away from the experience if the final thing doesn't work out, that I can then use to get ahead to the final sexy glorious internship at the amazing place. As long as it's a stepping stone and you see it as that, and maybe that then takes you down another path, but as long as it's something that you can use as a springboard to get to that, just if that's your end goal, just yeah. Find a way, make sure that thread is there, make sure that you you know why you're going into that job, for whatever that reason may be. And if that is towards your end goal, that's fine. But yeah, just make sure, and this is actually true for all of like, I, I don't mean to hide out this bad, but I've added myself to it ad hoc. Um, my piece of advice would be, don't forget the why 
because it's really easy to get into the nitty gritties of like, oh, this is what I want to do, I want to make money. And if that's not why I find this cash, you're in the right place for it. Like, welcome to London. But yeah, that why is really important. And in more cases than not, it will reflect in your own CV if the parent has missing loops. Um, and it will reflect in your cover letter if you copy pasted it. So as long as you're doing it for the right reason and whatever that right reason is for you, um, I think you'll be fine. Like Roger and I, this is just to end on a little story. And we were going here for three years and in our first year, we were we did these coffee mornings and we were just standing there panicking together, crying together about I'm never gonna find a job, I have no skill, I have nothing to do. This guy's been a Goldman, like president of IR society, he has a job at a hedge fund in London. I don't know anything about numbers, by the way. <laughs> um, media company, and like, it's just, you will take many detours. Do not be afraid of that. No, be it best. If you don't apply, like, you wouldn't have gotten it in any case. Just really, there's there's nothing to be brought. You will hear more, more than you hear yes. Um, but that's fine. And like, yeah, just be clear on why you're applying. And I think that's probably what's helping you the most. Yeah. Thank you for, for that, Tish. I feel like that was very uplifting. In a <laughs> uh, any last questions? No? Okay, well, then thank you so much for the panelists for sharing your experience. much to everyone both in person and virtually for joining. Um, we wanted to make you all aware about that uh, IR Society and War Studies Society are doing a career panel with War Studies alumni. Um, so people who have now finished their degrees and are now also exploring different sectors relevant to our field of study. It will be on 3rd of March right now. We haven't released any uh, marketing yet, but we will very soon. So do follow us on social media. Um, also just a little heads up for any War Studies members. Um, we have some very, very exciting being released Friday next week um, if you're up for some nice social stuff. Um, so do definitely have a look uh, and crush your fingers that COVID won't explode at some point. Um, yeah, so do look out for that. Thank you so much and have a really nice evening. Thank you guys. <laughs> Down the That's so true. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I don't remember being in tears with <laughs> 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 <laughs>